Hi, everyone. I'm Sam Valenti with, here with another C-Tray Sports one-on-one -on -one interview. My guest today won a silver medal in 2014 as part of the U.S. Olympic hockey team and is the radio color, color analyst for the Arizona Coyotes of the National Hockey League. She also holds hockey camps around the country, helping to develop the next generation of hockey players, the great Lindsay Fry. Lindsay, it's such an honor to be talking with you today. Well, thanks for having me, Sam. I appreciate it. Yes, yes, of course. And and we'll get in, we'll kind of get into things, you know, right now. Um, you know, no, as you know, it was a very interesting off season for the Coyotes. You know, there's the there was the arena vote in Tempe, which sadly didn't go through. Um, but but as you know, you know, the Oats are they're committed to staying here in the Valley, which is awesome. And, you know, let's just have our fingers crossed that everything can can go well and the Yotes can get a new arena here. But, you know, just kind of what are your thoughts on everything that has gone on this offseason? And, you know, going off of that, what's your outlook then on this upcoming season for the Coyotes? Yeah, good questions. It's It's definitely... I should say it was a tough pill to swallow, not getting the Tempe deal done. I, 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 and I think a lot of other people within our organization felt that it really was a fantastic deal, not only for us, but also for Tempe. I had the opportunity to, to interact with a lot of the city council members. They loved the deal. They thought that it was really well balanced and that they had really been able to put their, uh, their stamp on it. But unfortunately that's, that's life. And frankly, that's sports, you get knocked down and you just, you have to get, get right back up and keep going. And so that's what we're trying to do as an organization. Um, frankly, what happens next is certainly above my, my pay grade. I know that they leadership is working hard every single day to try to figure this out. Um, this is a, a massive agreement. And I think, you know, it's really important and this isn't, to to knock Gila River Arena when it was called that but I think there were certainly some learnings with that that you don't you don't want to just uh, build something because it's easy or it's convenient or it's less expensive you you want to make sure that you do it right and the bits the business model is going to work because ultimately if you don't have that viable business model in place then everybody suffers. And so I think that's what the Morellos are extremely committed to is trying to figure out how, how and where can they put an arena that ultimately is going to continue to sustain uh, not only itself, but also the Arizona Coyotes being in town. So that I know is what they're working on very, very hard right now. I think the other thing um that's that's really exciting is you talk about the off season everything that went on on the hockey side i think our our hockey operations is firing on all cylinders i think uh bill armstrong made some some really interesting moves i think our owners made some good investments getting players like jason zucker um getting players like matt dumba alex kerfoot who i actually went to harvard with um and it, it's it's really exciting to see it. and i think my brother actually is one of our videographers for the club and he's uh, in Australia right now with the team for their global series games. And um, it's pretty cool to hear him describe the energy of the team right now. So, you know, are we going to be a, a playoff contender making a deep run this year? Probably not, but the goal is going to be to play some really meaningful games down the stretch of the season um, and really start to have the pieces that, bill has put in place and our ownership has invested in uh, to see those pieces kind of line up and and hopefully get some good outcomes so i'm hoping especially as a broadcaster that we're in the hunt it makes games a lot more fun to call and i think we'll be there yeah absolutely it's gonna you know i bet it's gonna be another fun season at a mullet arena what a, oh, yeah. you know, what's that what's that been like for you getting to getting to call games at a mullet it's awesome I think there was a lot of skepticism around it and what it was going to be like. And I think people quickly realized that you put professional hockey in a small environment like that. It's loud. It's rowdy. It's fun. It's exciting. And you can see it. I mean, our players absolutely 
would thrive when they were playing at mullet. I think it was one of our best home records in several years. And that was even when we had, you know, by, by some people's measurement, a better team on the ice, but we just, we outperformed um, or the, the team, I should say outperformed when they were playing in mullet because of what a cool environment it is. And just the way it fueled them as a broadcaster, it was awesome. It's the best broadcasting seat in the entire national hockey league. You're like right on top of the ice. Normally we are the highest people in the building. We're all the way up at the top, way up in the rafters, uh, which is nice for some reasons. Cause you get a, a nice view of the entire ice, but there is something special about being able to see the guys facial expressions, being able to, to hear them talking to each other, talking to the refs. It's, it's very, very cool. So I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, uh, you know, it's a lot of fun for me as well as an ASU student getting to go to games, you know, just having a blast with friends is just such a unique and awesome atmosphere. And and, and, and I think definitely there's been a lot of, you know, students, you know, at ASU who've really gravitated towards going to going to see Yotes games because it's just just so much fun. Yeah, totally. And that student section's nice. You get a lot of a lot of rowdy people in there and it's 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 awesome. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, so so now I kind of want to talk a, li- a little bit about, about your background here and, and, and just and just kind of the, the journey that you've had and then kind of how you've gotten to the point where, where you uh, are at today. Uh, so you grew up in Chandler, which is uh, awesome, you, you, know, you know, local and everything. Uh, so I read that apparently you really got into hockey by watching the Mighty Ducks movies. And I think that's just awesome. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> Yeah, it's been a it's been a pretty cool journey. Um, When I think about where I started to where I've come, it's kind of cool to see the full circle effect of now working for not only working for my hometown NHL team that I looked up to when I was younger, but also now getting to build the girls program, the Arizona Kachinas, which is something that I never really had growing up, Um, certainly didn't have this many opportunities to play girls hockey here. So uh, when I was younger, I I did fall in love with hockey because of the Mighty Ducks movies. And I started actually as a roller hockey player because there was more roller here than there was ice. And then I was really a beneficiary of the Coyotes originally coming here from Winnipeg because during that time, a bunch of rinks were getting built because there was a lot of excitement around hockey. So I think it was in 1998, I want to say, that the rink in Chandler, which is where I grew up, uh, got built. And I had been playing a little bit of roller hockey, and I went out, played some ice, and absolutely fell in love with it. But as you can imagine, there were very, very few girls playing. I was usually the only girl on my team which I really didn't mind because when we could start do like doing like full body checking, um, I was a foot taller than all the boys. So I loved it. Um, and then unfortunately, because we didn't have a bigger ecosystem of girls hockey here, I actually had to switch and, and go to Colorado. Um, I flew back and forth to Colorado to play girls hockey. And the goal was of course, to get recruited to play in college um, which I eventually did, uh, got recruited to go play at Harvard and was able to play on a couple under 18 national teams for team USA. And then there's <laughs> college was a whole roller coaster of a journey as most people's college experiences are, but eventually scratched and clawed my way onto the, uh, 2014 Olympic team. And it's been, uh, it's been phenomenal to take all of that and now turn it into a sports career back at home. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, definitely. You, you know, and I, th- I think it's so cool. I mean, I mean, do you still watch like, like, like the Mighty Ducks movies from time to time? Like, like, like today, do you still, still watch those? Occasionally, I have to admit, I haven't watched the new series that's come out on Disney Plus. Um, mostly because I feel like there will be time for that once I have kids of my own and we can share that together. But it's funny because my favorite one is D two, where they're like you know, playing in the junior Olympics for team USA. And I, maybe a year or two ago, uh, when Disney plus had just come out, I watched it with, uh, with my wife and I was like, 
I mean, for me, it was all the nostalgia in the world, right? It's just amazing how all the lines come back to you. But it is because she she's watching it from the lens of like a first time viewer. And, you know, there's cheesy lines and very obvious choreography and things like that. And she's like, man, this this was it. This is what did it. And I'm like, listen, this is this is movie magic right here. This is the best. So um yeah that's I think that's the last time I watched it It was a couple years ago but I love I love when I get to tell my story to some of the girls that I coach around the country that when I say Mighty Ducks they all still know exactly what it is and get all excited so it's uh it's pretty special to share that with them yeah absolutely you know those movies they're they're still they're they're still classics you know I can just turn them on anytime and still love them uh you know I I know I think I'm a little bit more of a more of a a miracle guy that's kind of my favorite hockey movie so you know I so yeah so so that that tends to be on maybe a little bit more but always love the mighty duck so I'm right with you right there um and 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 then you uh you you know you're talking about about going to Harvard and and I think that's so cool you know and it's funny because last summer I was able to actually go visit Harvard just kind of on a trip to Boston and wow, I mean, it's gorgeous. It is gorgeous there. Um, what kind of made you want to attend Harvard? How did you know? How did you choose to go there for college? Good question. So I was really fortunate in the the sense that I had um, a, a number of opportunities to play Division One college hockey. Some of which I could have gone on a full scholarship, but I think the way I always viewed it was being able to go to an Ivy League school was sort of the ultimate reward for all of the time and effort and energy I had poured into playing hockey my whole life. Um, you know, there wasn't really a, a lucrative women's hockey professional opportunity at the time. And so I knew that I was going to need to be able to do something else after college. And what better way to kind of set yourself up for success than to be able to go to an Ivy League school if you could. So truthfully, I I really was choosing between Harvard and Cornell. Um, And I really did love Cornell, but I think I would have struggled in Ithaca, New York, and not really having much of a city around me. Uh, And Boston, to your point, is just beautiful. And awesome and so historic I love I love kind of that historical nature of it so I'm super thankful that that's that's what I ended up deciding and have loved it ever since and I'm still super involved I'm on the the board for our our giving group for the hockey programs and try to make it back there at least once or twice a year so I I I love it it's near and dear to my heart I am a sun devil though I did get my I did get my MBA from ASU so I'm I'm part of the AZ fam. Don't worry. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 you and uh, you, and you know what they say. You know, some people say that ASU is the Harvard of the uh, of like the Southwest. So they, they sure do. <laughs> I'll buy that. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, uh, but so what, what like like what specific favorite memories do you have from from just from just getting to kind of be at Harvard, getting to attend? I mean, really, one of the world's most prestigious universities. Just. Do you have any kind of specific favorite memories from your time there, whether it's just being on campus or, of course, your time playing hockey? Oh, man, I think there's there's so many. Um, you know, I think as an adult, I've I can appreciate the fact that um, the memories that were not so great in the moment are now I look back on them as some of the most pivotal moments of my life just some of those really challenging times that you experienced during college and I I had plenty of them but I think as as far as just the pure positive memories um it was just such a a gift and a joy to be part of a team and to automatically have you know 20 something friends built in the second you got on campus and you know whether it was the the random, you know, parties or traditions or whatever it was that we had, um, or just spending time with each other in the dining hall. That's what I remember and and look back on with so much joy. Um, I think as far as hockey memories are concerned, there's probably two that really, really stick out. Um, 
One of them was there was a stretch where we had a Saturday game one weekend, and then our next game was a Friday. And I got four goals in this game, and then I got three more goals in this game. So I had seven goals in two games. That was pretty cool. And then um, I actually have three. I, another one was beating BC to win the Bean Pot, which is a local Boston tournament amongst the the four Boston schools. We did that my senior year. It was the only time we did it, and that was pretty awesome. And then um, the the other one was we specifically in Boston was we beat Quinnipiac to go to the Frozen Four for the first and only time I had been able to do it in my career, and that was pretty that was pretty amazing. Well, th th that's awesome. You know, no, that's great. And Harvard, you know, just Harvard, Harvard does you know just in general have have great hockey programs. And, uh, and, and of course, you know, here, you know, here at ASU, you know, you know, we've seen, we've seen hockey grow at this university and, and not just with, not just on the men's side, like everyone talks about, but, but the women's side as well, you know, we, you know, we have a club team here that's really successful and stuff. Um, so it's been really kind of great getting to see that here, um, you know, getting to see the hockey stuff uh, grow at this school in the desert of all places. Hey, that's what I tell people. It's that's the beautiful thing about an indoor sport is you can still play it anywhere. Yep, absolutely. Now, now, now from Harvard, like you mentioned, you eventually found yourself playing in the Olympics, which is so awesome. And I can only imagine I can only imagine the the memories you have from that getting to getting to be in Russia and everything. Uh, I believe it was Sochi uh, at that Olympics. Uh, so just, you know, overall, you know, what memories from that entire experience stick out to you of course you know you can you can mention some of the great games that, that you guys had because some of those teams on that run you guys just blew some teams out um and but you know do you have any kind of just memories even from just being in the village and everything Be, because you know that's such a cool part about being at the olympics is being in the olympic village so just overall what kind of memories stick out to you from that experience yeah, I mean, the village is cool because you get to interact with athletes, not just from around the world, but also from your own country. And you don't really realize it when you're a team athlete or a team sport athlete, because, you know, you go into the dining hall and you see your teammates and you sit with them. And that's what you do. But a lot of the individual sport athletes, so the the figure skaters was probably the group we got the closest to you know, they see a team USA jacket and they're like, well, that's my team. And so it was cool the way that, you know, we would all just sit together and get to know one another. And, um, you know, it was really nice to get to interact with like at, at that time, it was Gracie Gold was kind of the big uh, figure skater that was there competing. And then um, uh, Charlie White and Meryl Davis were were the big ice dancing couple of the era so we spent a lot of time with them um and then obviously just getting to to see people from all these different countries interact I I love the culture um the cultural experience of meeting people from around the world I love the language aspect of it um and then obviously seeing some of the NHL guys was pretty cool I actually at one point was like reaching for something at the salad bar and I bumped hands with someone and I was like, Oh, sorry. And I looked up and it was Alex Ovechkin. And, you know, so those are just kind of the little things that you never, you never forget. Um, as far as the, the actual hockey side of it, I mean, I think, I think the, the most memorable thing for me was just having my family there. And I had, I was so fortunate. I had a lot of people there. I had my parents, my grandparents, my parents, best friends, my best friend, my brother, um, and so it was just like every game, I was always looking for where they were because I was very, very aware of the fact that being from Arizona and playing on the Olympic ice hockey team was that doesn't happen without a support system that doesn't happen without sacrifice and everything that my family did to help me get there. And so, I mean, I, I truly reflect back and being able to share that experience with my family was my all time part of the Olympics. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, th I think that that's just such, such a great part about, about that whole experience of being at the Olympics is you're getting, 
you're getting exposed to all these different cultures and you're able to make connections with with all these different people and you're, and it's in a way it kind of ends up being almost like almost like a learning experience really you know we're getting to like learn about you know all these different you know nations and you know know and what life is like you know life is like in these other places and stuff it's you know it's really fascinating totally it's also interesting to like interact with elite athletes from other sports you know, like I, I had no idea how bobsledders trained. I had really no idea how figure skaters trained. Like, it was just cool to, to like, everybody trains a little bit differently, but the passion and the commitment level and everything it takes to be there is the same. And that was, that was pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, now I want to talk about kind of your business right now. I want to get into to all your stuff about running these hockey camps and stuff, which I think is so cool. Um, how how did this all begin for you? So I finished college and had no idea what I wanted to do. I originally was a mechanical engineering major because I wanted to build rides for Disneyland, and then was terrible at physics. So. I ended up switching to a major called history of science, which really like, unless you're going to be a historian of science PhD at Harvard, you don't really do a whole lot with that specifically. Um, So when I graduated, I was like, I don't really know what I want. I actually didn't want to be involved in hockey at all. I kind of was of the mindset that if I did hockey, then that was just like a a cop out. That was the easy thing to do. Um, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I got home and I decided, okay, well, I'll run a camp in Arizona and then I'll run a camp in Colorado because that's where I played in high school and sort of give back to my communities, my my two communities. Um, so my parents helped me, you know, set up an LLC and registration and kind of like help get the initial off the ground. And I started as I was, as I was preparing for these, I started to realize, man, there's probably not anyone like me that's going to these smaller hockey markets where there are girls playing. And I literally just started Googling like the most random places I could think of. Like, I didn't even know if there was girls hockey there. So I was like, Albuquerque, girls hockey, Alabama, girls hockey, Portland, girls hockey, like just trying to to find contacts. And I was just cold emailing people, seeing if they'd be interested in me coming and running a camp. And um, that was sort of the the start of Lindsay Fry Hockey. And I've been running that. Next summer will be a, a decade of running Lindsay Fry Hockey, which is pretty cool. And um, this past summer was my biggest summer yet. I had 12 camps, which maybe doesn't sound like a lot, but 12 weekends on the road throughout the summer is a lot um and takes a lot of energy so it's been pretty cool to see how it's grown and um yeah we're actually going to do like a strategic planning meeting in a couple weeks to see how we really blow it up and make it even better for the next 10 years uh, that's awesome you know that that is, that is so so cool it's cool that you've been able to do that for 10 years you're running a very successful business um you, you know to in, in case there's anyone you know who might be who might end up watching this who, you know, who might end up being, you know, interested in, in, in doing, you know, one of your camps, you know, just what does, you know, what does like the typical, what does the typical camp look, look like, you, you know, that, that, that you run, what does like a typical kind of one sort of look like, like what's kind of the, you know, what all yeah. things happen there? Yeah. So a couple pieces of that, um, you know, one of the things that I'll probably look to adjust now that I've, I've grown the brand a little bit and grown the business is try to figure out how I can get a little bit more targeted because currently, um, you know, I go to these markets where there aren't a ton of girls playing. And so the last thing I want to do is be like, this is a 16 and older camp only. Um, so my camps are super inclusive. I, you know, have girls ages eight all the way up through 18. And we we split up the age groups and everything, but it's really more of a holistic skill development camp. So I'll usually go in on a Friday, we'll run uh, skating that night. The next day we'll do stick handling, passing, shooting, body contact. And then uh, we always try to have Sunday fun day where they get to play a lot of games. And then one thing that was really important to me uh, to include in my camps was not just the on-ice stuff, I really wanted to make sure there was an off ice 
kind of classroom element to it because that was something that was so influential in my career was, you know, nutrition, mindset, mental performance, um, helping these kids who maybe have no idea what college hockey opportunities are out there, out there for them, educating them on that. So um, I'll integrate those those pieces to the camp as well. So as far as what it looks like next year, it could be a little different, but that's how I've been running them the last uh, the last several years. That wow, that's great, and and I think you know, and, and as you mentioned this, you know, kind of including, including that that off ice stuff. Uh, you know, I think that I think that's awesome. I think, I think you know, it's really important to 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 not just focus on on just like drills and stuff, but to focus on that other stuff, like you mentioned. I think they, I think that's really important, and it kind of you know, it, and it might you know set your camps apart from you know other ones. Yeah, and I think I've especially from like the teenagers um who maybe have really never thought about mindset before um or you know especially working with young teenage women um body image and and self confidence is a very real issue so to be able to talk about nutrition in a very practical and healthy way with them um has been has been awesome and hopefully super powerful for the girls yes yes absolutely um now, now I kind of want to talk about how you got involved with the Yotes and how you got, you know, how, how you got your role as a radio color commentator. So, so I saw that you kind of started working with the Yotes around 2018. Um, so, so how did you get involved with the Yotes first off? And then how did the role as color analyst come about? I... I have had several roles with the Coyotes. I originally, um, actually, I was I was being contracted part time while I was in business school, getting my MBA from ASU, and that was um, originally for uh, my my job was to help kind of build a foundational program for girls hockey called Small Fries, and which we still run that program today. And the idea was we were struggling to keep girls in hockey after they go through learn to play because, you know, some girls like me, they don't care. They'll play with boys, girls, like it doesn't matter to them, but there were a lot of girls that would go out there for learn to play, get knocked down by a boy and be like, I don't want to do this anymore. So the objective was to create a program where we could help get all the girls together and retain them so we could grow something bigger long-term. So that's, that's really how I initially got my foot in the door and then in 2018, uh, the CEO at the time, Aaron Cohen, uh, I had met him a couple times at Coyotes games. And he, I think, just really saw the value that I could bring beyond girls hockey, um, which, don't get me wrong, is still predominantly what I do as far as like my day job is concerned. But um he, I think, recognized like, look, you're you you know girls hockey, you know women's hockey, but you also have a Harvard degree and an MBA. There has to be a place for you within the organization. So he hired me originally full time as uh, the, I think I was like the special advisor to the president and CEO, and then eventually that uh, shifted. I, I rolled into a marketing uh, position, and then. After that, I kind of got like really focused specifically on girls hockey because of how much it was growing. It was requiring more attention from me um, because we we had started a program called the Arizona Kachinas, which is an all girls association. And anybody that works in youth sports knows that when you've got, you know, 250 kids, you've got 500 parents and they all look to you to take care of everything. So um that was uh that was sort of where I landed. And then during that time, I think in 20, I think it was in 20, late 2020. Yeah, I think it was, I think it was 2020. Um I we we had just had our radio analyst choose to move on. Um Paul Bissonette, he's like now very famous with his bar stool podcast and is on uh tnt and it's just a very busy man so that position had opened and i think you know one of the things that coyotes have always tried to do is really drive um de and i efforts and i think they they realized that they had a 
an expert on the game who happened to be a, a woman. And there have only been like four of us who have ever held this position in the NHL before. Um, so they, they asked me if I was interested and I had never thought about it before. Like I'm, I'm very comfortable doing interview stuff and, you know, had had some media training just through the Olympic experience, but I had never even considered being a broadcaster. And so I, uh, they had me do like a mock call with the play-by-play, -play, uh, radio guy. And we just called a game, like a random game from the past off of a TV screen. And I did, I did okay. I mean, <laughs> I'm definitely a lot better now than I was then. I think I said they need to pick up the sticks like 10 times in that initial trial. But I think they felt that I was, I was going to be able to, to learn it and figure it out if they gave me a chance and they did. And um, yeah, it's been, it's been awesome. And um, I hope I can continue doing it for a long time, but we'll see. So it's, uh, I, I think one of the biggest reasons I said yes to the job was because of how few women had done it. And I wanted to be able to show other girls and women that they could do it too. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I think it's, you know, and, and something that I really like it kind of about just, you know, if you look at the NHL, you know, is, is that there, it seems like, like there is, you know, a growing amount of, you know, female commentators, which is awesome. You know, obviously there is you, uh, I, I know there, I know there's AJ as well. And you got, uh, Lilia Hextall who does play by play, which is really cool. So, so you gotta, you know, you know, you know, you, you see like this increasing amount of females in the booth. And I think that is so awesome. And I just hope that that, you know, number continues to grow because, cause I, you know, you, you know, especially of course with you, you, you know, I'm always, tuning in on the radio to listen to, to your analysis. So it's, you know, you know, everyone just does such a great job. And hopefully that number can just continue to increase, you know, in the coming years. I appreciate that. One of the cool things is you mentioned AJ, but also Jennifer Botterill, who does a lot of stuff with TSN. Mm -hmm. And um, both of them are Harvard women's hockey players. So I've actually had the opportunity to like reach out to them and get some mentorship and try to try to always get better. Oh, that's awesome. Wow. That's so cool. Um, so, so, you know, in, in your role as color analyst, you, you know, obviously I'm sure, you, you know, you have to do a lot of prep, you, you know, and I'm, I'm going to a, to a broadcasting school right now. You, you know, I've, it's a big thing that's kind of nailed into our heads, right? Is you got to do your prep, you know, you got to do your homework. So kind of what's your, what's your prep like for each broadcast that you do? Uh, good question. So, I think one of the hardest things for me is because I do still have another job with the coyotes. Um, it's, it's balancing doing the work I need to do for that during the day while also finding the time to prep for the game. That's going to be at night. Um, you know, it's interesting because for me, I, I think it's a different type of prep than play by play play by play. They've got to be like very, very dialed in on, the names, the numbers, the, uh, you know, fun facts about the players that they can drop as they're talking about the play in the game. Um, and, and all of those things are definitely important for the analyst to have, but quite frankly, we can, we can sort of cheat a little bit in the sense that, you know, I'm not really calling anything until my play by play partners already said who made the play. So I would say, you know, I definitely study the names and numbers um, and I have like a little sheet that I, it's just a consistent sheet that I'm constantly updating and, and, uh, working off of. And I try to start studying like the day or two before, um, just cause obviously you gotta, you gotta grill all those names and numbers into your brain. Uh, I think the, the bigger thing that as the analyst, I really try to focus on are, you know, who are kind of the hot players on the team right now who uh, who are maybe some of the big players that are struggling lately, haven't gotten a point in several games. Like it's it's kind of investigative in that way. You get to you get to sort of look at the stats, you get to read the 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 stories and the press and and try to figure out what story you want to tell throughout the broadcast. Um, and there's there's different things you have to prep for. So like I do TV work for the pregame show. Um, mm -hmm. That's very scripted. So it, that's, that's pretty much like research what the producers have created on the script 
and then be prepared to talk about it once you and I usually will meet up with my host and just make sure we're on the same page with how that's going to flow um in game the beauty is like yes you want to have some of these fun facts and these tidbits but uh kind of the awesome thing about my job is I get to call what I see so it's really more about being able to say what I need to say when the moment on the ice takes place um so it's certainly a it's it's certainly a, a fair amount of prep very different than a play-by-play prep. Yeah, definitely. And, and and I'm glad that you mentioned your TV stuff as well, baby, because again, you know, you do that stuff, you know, you know, you know, you're awesome there as well. And I think it's so cool, cool that, that like one second you'll be on TV, you'll be on Valley with like Todd Walsh or something. And then it seems like a couple seconds later, like, like Oh, you're in the booth. I, that is accurate. And I will say that has been much nicer at mullet because when we were at Gila river arena, the booth and, or like the, the TV desk and the booth were on opposite sides of the building. So I was like trying to like run in heels and that was a pain. Now it's literally like 30 feet from the balcony to my booth, which has been really nice yeah yes that's definitely much nicer i would agree um so now this is my this is my last question here i got for you and 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 then and, and this is kind of you know maybe you can send this message to all the you know all like the canadian hockey fans who are like these gatekeepers and and, and they say hockey oh hockey shouldn't be in the south it shouldn't be in the desert so so my question to you is what makes the valley a great market for hockey Oh my gosh. Um, so many things. I mean, I, I think the interest is there. Like the rinks are absolutely packed. We, we definitely need more of them given the demand. Um, the way that it has grown over the last five years, 10 years, 20 years is remarkable. And I honestly feel like we're just starting to really scratch the surface as far as diversity efforts, which for, you know, anybody in business today, D and I, is in and of itself a business strategy. You start to reach out to a broader base and more communities and you're going to get more hockey players, more business, everything. Um, Obviously my particular focus has been in girls hockey, which has grown. I mean, even just our association has grown 64% over the last five years. And we're, we're kind of like maxed out with the ice that we have available to us. Um, and then, you know, now, now the coyotes are running a lot of cool DE and I programs, um, which will hopefully continue to drive that. So I think the fact that we've grown so much since the team has been here and like, we still have so much to go gets me really excited about what hockey in the desert could be. Um, I think the other beautiful thing is you know, we have opportunities to play hockey in a lot of different ways. We can play street hockey. We can play roller hockey. We can play, you know, pretty much anywhere, anytime, um, which not all places can do where it rains and snows and, you know, we don't have that. I think the fact that we've got multiple college hockey programs. I mean, you mentioned it earlier. We talked about the ASU D1 men's team, which is amazing that we have that. Um, but there's several college club teams at ASU. There's several club teams at GCU, several club teams at U of A. I mean, there is there is so much. Um, and at NAU, there's there's club teams. So um, I, I think there's just such a, an abundance of it that people don't realize. Um, and I certainly hope that, you know, we can keep the Coyotes here because that is a huge huge part of that, the investment in the community and, you know, the programming that the Coyotes runs to help build that is, is awesome. And we're one of the biggest metropolitan areas in the country. Like we are one of the biggest cities. It's just continuing to build that fan base. So it, it absolutely belongs here. I hope that I am a product of that having you know the opportunity to play d1 college and play on the olympics and that doesn't happen without hockey in the desert yep absolutely i'm in 100 percent agreement with you and you know you know and i just want to say that that i have a lot of respect for for the work that you've done in in obviously growing the game in arizona and as you've mentioned throughout this you know your work 
with uh, with diversity and inclusion efforts. You know, all, all your work, I just have a ton of respect for, for you for what you've been doing. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's been a fun, it's been a fun ride and um, we'll, we'll see what the future brings, but anywhere we have the opportunity to make a difference through hockey. And I tell people all the time, literally everything good in my life has come through hockey. Um, if we can give that to, to other people, then that is the ultimate gift and the ultimate joy. Yep, absolutely. Well, well, Lindsay, thank you so much for 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 letting me, you know, have this opportunity to speak with you today. It's truly, truly an honor to be able to talk with you. Well, I'm so happy we could finally make it happen. And thanks for uh, thanks for taking the time to talk about all things hockey. I love it.